So we're now going to touch on the issue of how to do multiple integrals and really focus on the, the main tool that we have to do in order to perform multiple integrals, which is coordinate transformations. And for our purposes, I'm going to restrict ourselves to looking at just double integrals, although a lot of what we say goes over to higher dimensions. Most of the problems we're going to look at are going to be restricted to just situations where we can do double um, integrals. And so the notion here is that, you know, we have we're integrating over some finite region um, in the xy plane. And we're performing an integral now that looks like this. Okay. And the question is, first of all, what does this mean? Okay. Well, we can derive the double integral actually the same way that we did um, an integral of just one variable, where we take the um, integration interval in the x direction and we divide it into n subintervals, and then we do the same in the y direction, divide it into m subintervals, and we get this grid. And so the notion then is we can get some sort of Riemann sum as a function of the, the subinterval widths. And we notice that if we look at the terms in this summation, they're basically little elements of volume. Okay. This is our length, our width, and our functions, our height. And so we're actually doing a summation over infinitesimal volume elements, which means that when we let delta x and delta y go to zero, just like we were approximating an area by, by rectangles, here we're approximating a volume by cubes. In the limit of delta x, delta y go to zero, that's going to actually be the volume under the curve. So double integrals represent volumes, and more specifically, they represent signed volumes. The volume is, is below the xy plane. It can be considered a negative volume, okay? There are two issues that arise. The first is, do we have to worry about the order of integration? And this is important because very often we do have to change the order of integration. So it's important to understand what this means. So, for example, we might have some integral defined as the integral from 1 to 2 with respect to dy and the integral 0 to 1 with respect to dx. Okay. And first, it's important to understand what this integral means. What this means is that we're, we're doing this integration in horizontal strips. Okay. We're letting y vary from 1 to 2. And for each value of y, we're doing the integral with respect to x. That's what this order of integration means. And you can kind of see it here on this, on, this, uh, on this graph, okay? We're fixing y, and for each y, we're doing the integration with respect to x. We're getting this area, and then this gives us a little volume element. And then we're summing up all those little volume elements. That's what that means. So one question that arises is, well, can we change the order? And the answer is yes, almost always. It's very rarely the case that we don't. Theoretically, there is a, a theorem um, that we use. It's called Fubini's theorem. And I won't go into the proof. It's quite difficult to prove. But long story short, it just says that if the function is bounded on this rectangle, and this notation is just referring to it, it's the Cartesian product, this, this Cartesian product basically refers to this area right here. Okay. Saying that if, if f is bounded on a finite rectangle and one of the integrals exists, then we can switch the order of integration. Okay. So it's very rare that we have to worry about the order of integration. The question of how we change the order of integration can be a little tricky, and I'm going to give you some practice problems on that. The bigger issue comes up in how we change variables. It's very often the case that we want to do an integration in another set of variables, possibly because the integral is easier or it's just better suited to the geometry of the particular region we're looking at. And suppose we wanted to, to just transform from Cartesian to polar. 
can I just change, uh, you know, x to r and, you know, y to theta, or can I substitute in for x and y in terms of r and theta, and then just let my differential be dr d theta? And the answer is no. And so remember what we had to do before when we did the, the u substitution, which is a change of variables. First we had to change the integrand. So this means that I'm going to have to be able to solve for x and y in terms of my two variables of integration, u and v. And I'm just going to substitute those in. So usually changing the integrand is not difficult. One of the parts that is, is different, though, is the differential. And so the differential last time it was it was a little it was a little it, it was like this but it wasn't quite as involved here what we have to do to change a differential is we're going to say the differential uh, dx dy is equal to the determinant of this matrix which is called the Jacobian matrix times du dv okay so this is a little more involved changing the differential and finally, we have to change the limits of integration. And this can be very tricky. So let me do an example first where we have to concentrate on just changing the, the differential. Okay. And I want to look at this integral where I'm integrating e to the minus quantity x squared plus y squared in the whole xy plane. I want to do this in polar coordinates. And I'm going to show you why this integral is important later on when we do a homework problem. Okay, so I'm going to start off. I'm going to find x and y in terms of r and theta. And I'm going to change my integrand, so that's relatively easy. Then I'm going to compute the Jacobian. So I take the partial of x with respect to r, and I get cosine theta. Partial of x with respect to theta, get minus r, r sine theta. And do the same for y. And when I, when I evaluate that Jacobian, I just get r. Okay, now the Jacobian, the the determinant of the Jacobian matrix always has to be non-negative but in this case I don't have to worry because R itself is defined as the, the polar coordinate which is always uh, non-negative so I don't have to put absolute values around here and finally I change the limits of integration well if you think about the limits of integration in the XY plane you know basically R can go from 0 to infinity and theta can go from 0 to 2 pi and so I put all this together and I get the following. Okay. Now notice I can change the order of integration because I can show, if I wanted to be really careful, I can show that e to the minus r squared times r is bounded. Okay. And as long as it's bounded and continuous and the integral exists in one direction it'll exist in the other and so I'm going to test that I'm going to I'm going to change the order and see if it exists how could I prove this is, is bounded by the way I can use L'Hopital's rule if I wanted to actually prove this I can show that this is bounded using L'Hopital's rule and if you want to you can you can do that as an exercise and so since it's bounded I'm going to change the order of integration and see if it see if I can get it to work out of course, the first integral in d theta is easy because that's just evaluates to 2 pi. And the second integral is not that difficult because I can use the uh, change of variables. u is equal to r squared. And this final integral just evaluates to 1. And so I'm going to get pi. And we're going to see why this integral is important. It also it actually relates to the normal distribution. But this shows you, this is an example that focuses on just the change of variables. Notice the Jacobian was really the major part because uh, the, the changing the uh, range of integration was not a big deal. This was kind of obvious how to do the uh, limits of integration. Now I want to focus on an example where we're looking at the limits of integration. So I want to evaluate this, this integral right here. Okay. And it kind of makes sense to say, well, let's choose the variables u is equal to x plus y and v is equal to 1, y minus 2x. Because, you notice to try to do this integral would actually be quite difficult. Okay, um, And in fact, it, it would be an interesting exercise to see if it would even be possible to do. I am, uh, 
because you have this square root of uh, x plus y, which would make it very difficult to integrate everything else. It's probably possible, but not, not very easy. So the easy thing to do is to do a change of variables. We always take difficult problems and we try to change them into simpler problems. So I know how to integrate this and I know how to integrate this. And so it makes sense to try this change of variables. Okay, so first of all, uh, we have to change the integrand. Well, that's easy. I cold-bloodedly set this up so the integrand will be easy to evaluate. Then I have to do the differential, and I'll leave this as an exercise to you, but if you notice, this is just a linear system of equations, and I can easily solve for x and, uh, x and y in terms of u and v. And when I take the uh, partials and put them in the Jacobian matrix and evaluate the determinant, I just get one-third. And I'll let you go through the math and verify that. The reason why I chose this example was to focus on the limits of integration. So if we go back and, and we look at this problem, okay, this was looking like this. So what is this saying? Well, this is telling us that x goes from 0 to 1, and I'm integrating in vertical strips. For each value of x, y goes from 0 to 1 minus y. So y is equal to, I'm sorry, y goes to 1 minus x, which tells me that this boundary is the line x plus y is equal to 1. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to express this boundary in terms of u and v, and when I do, I find this is u is equal to 1. Now notice that u, if I look at these strips, okay, these strips are always going to be u is equal to a constant. Okay, if I look at these strips right here. And so you see that u goes from 0 to 1. Okay, this, is, this is the strip where u is equal to 0, and it goes all the way up to u is equal to 1 because x plus y is equal to u. Okay. When I evaluate these other two boundaries, I find on the uh, horizontal axis, this translates the y equal to 0 boundary, translates into v is equal to minus 2u, and the boundary x is equal to 0, translates into u is equal to v. So the smart way to do this integration is to change the integrand, change the differential, and now let u go from 0 to 1, and since u is positive, minus 2u will be the lower limit of integration, and u will be the upper limit of integration. And when you substitute in for the Jacobian and do this integral, you should get 2 ninths. Okay. So changing, changing the limits of integration can be rather challenging. And I'll give some practice problems on this. This is important to know how to do. Okay, next we're going to tackle our, our, our very last uh, technique for our integration, and then we're finished with this um, sequence.